Hi, I'm Star Wars artist Matt Bush, and you are watching Awaken Nation with Brad Zales. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up. Tired of the way things used to be, they are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zales, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers, the disruptors, and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> How's it going, buddy? <laughs> It's going really good. You know, uh, I got to give a big shout out to one of my high school classmates at Lebanon High who turned me on to you. And that's Tommy Snyder, Mr. Tom Snyder. Uh, he said, hey, you got to check this dude out. He's been working with, you know, George Lucas, you know, Lucasfilm and uh, doing Star Wars work. And he's from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And so I was like, I reached out to you like immediately. And here's awesome. the funny side of this. Tom goes, Hey, I think you should check out his website and reach out to him. And I go, dude, I did that 20 minutes ago. <laughs> he awesome. was like, what? You know, so welcome to the show. Uh, you're in for a treat, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if you are a Star Wars fan, you're gonna love the work. I'm gonna put some of it up on YouTube so some of you can see the video of Matt's work. Uh, but uh, Matt has worked uh, well. I'll let you talk about it. I'm talking, I'm just a uh, chatty Kathy this morning. But Matt, yeah. welcome to the show, man. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, most people know me for the Star Wars work that I've done, and uh, Lucasfilm and Disney have been my, my biggest clients. But I've also had uh, I've also been fortunate enough to work on properties like Indiana Jones, uh. Lord of the Rings and even Stranger Things, which is uh, what all the kids are into today. Um, so I've just I've just been really really fortunate with this uh, with this career, and it's just taken me on all kinds of uh, pathways and even into uh, my own uh, filmmaking adventures today. We've had a couple of uh, Lebanon natives who are huge Star Wars advocates, um, Tom Newmaster, who named both his sons Luke and Ben, and. Oh, wow. uh, also started a packaging company that does multi-million dollars worth of business every year called Force Packaging. He, nice. Him and his wife go down to the Disney uh, Star Wars experience probably every year. Um, yeah, so we, we have a lot of Star Wars nut jobs on here like myself. Uh, although I started with Star Trek, I believe they can both live in the same universe. <laughs> I believe that too. I believe that too. Why can't we all get along? That's right. <laughs> uh, how long did you live in Lebanon, by the way? Uh, you were born there. Um, and... I was born there. I only lived there for uh, for probably two or three years of my life. I've been back mm -hmm. to visit a few times. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so not not too long. But uh, but I'm I love Pennsylvania. I'm definitely a Pennsylvania boy at heart. Yeah. Me too. I've lived in New York City for 35 years. Oh, wow. I, gr I grew up in Pennsylvania. I went to, you know, junior high, kindergarten, high school there. I saw Star Wars when I was 14. I j it was the only movie I dragged my parents to see, which if you know baby boomers, we did not want to be seen in public with our <laughs> parents, uh, which we'll talk about when we get started. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Oh yeah, and, and that's when Star Wars started to become more and more part of the zeitgeist. And um, I did a lot of my portfolio. I had a lot of illustrations, but back then, going to Hollywood was really considered like, you know, good luck with that. You know, it's a it was a super pipe dream. Mm -hmm. So I wound up going to New York City and becoming a graphic designer because I just you know taking that chance, taking that risk. It was a huge risk back then. Today, you know, you can get a job as a director for TV commercials. You know, I mean, it's it's a very different world now. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sure. but let's dig in. How did this all get started? You were born in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Yeah, uh, you weren't there that long, but you you still have those Pennsylvania roots. Went to Detroit, yeah. and you saw Star Wars for the first time. How old were you? And what was it that just made you go, "Oh, I think this is what I want to do for the rest of my life." <laughs> yeah, you know it was funny. I um I was four years old, and I was kind of uh, late to the party because all my friends had seen it, and I wanted to. I really didn't know that much about it. I just knew all my friends were talking about this thing called Star Wars. Well, mm -hmm. it was a huge phenomenon back then. Obviously, my parents went to go see it first, 
because back in the day when parents were parents, they would go preview a movie first to make sure it was okay for the kids to watch. They actually determined that it was a little too, maybe a little too intense uh, for someone that was four years old. So I wasn't allowed to go see it. So what happened was, you know, the movie probably had been out like three months and uh, my grandparents were watching me for the weekend and they said, Maddie, what do you want to do today? And I said, let's go see Star Wars. And they were like, "Uh, are you sure your parents would be okay with that? And I was like, of course they'd be okay with that. (laughs) So I tricked my grandparents into taking me. And then I just, uh, it just changed my life. Before that, I was into Hot Wheels and and Spider-Man. But then, you know, Star Wars, like, like forget the Hot Wheels, you know, X-Wing fighters. And like, just my mind was just in a whole nother universe. And it just... uh, it was just the most amazing thing. Dr. Michio Keiko said Star Wars initiated a paradigm shift. And I have to tell you, it did. Because before 1977, the movies we went to see were Westerns, detective thrillers, romance, things like that. Once in a while, you'd get a thriller. Uh, and once in a blue moon, you would get a science fiction movie that made people go, whoa, like the day the Earth stood still or Forbidden Planet our 2001 a space odyssey and the i always am astounded by this matt you know the history of of hollywood and all this executives never really got why those science fiction films that were done well did well at the box office like they could never figure out well you have a whole set of people who are obsessed with this and um They even said when uh, Gene Roddenberry first showed the trailer or the first episode he had done uh, to create Star Trek, um, the audience just sat there in stunned silence after that 45 minute show. And slowly there was this clap, clap, clap. And then everybody rose and there was this thunderous standing ovation because for the first time on television, people took science fiction seriously it moved out of the genre of being this kid show to an adult show a western in space as gene roddenberry called it and i'm painting the picture for everybody who's who's listening or watching when star wars came out you may not know this matt but if you said you were a star trek fan when i was a kid you got beat up okay sure oh i i remember that's what it was like when we were kid when i was a kid as well yeah and some millennials might be shocked by this but uh when star wars came out it made it cool and from that moment on and you can look this up the top 10 blockbuster films from 1977 on were science fiction or fantasy driven and before that it was more reality driven you know westerns and all that other stuff but 1977 is the big shift and uh we'll get back to you uh sorry i went a little long-winded but i wanted everybody to understand star wars changed uh, movies uh the the literary genre because uh now we had women who could save themselves in in movies and in in you know books and television and you're in the middle of all this and what made you decide that this would be your career <laughs> gosh you know it was it was everything it was um obviously it was it was a great story um you know as a kid i didn't know as i didn't realize as much how profound the story was and you know good versus evil and even um uh especially with the second one like some of the amazing things that yoda said i was more as a kid i was um just more surface level starships and robots and Mm -hmm. and aliens that was the kind of thing that really that really blew my mind and star wars was just neat because because it was made for what i call kids of all ages as Mm -hmm. i got older I just continue to appreciate these films on different levels as I, you know, as, as, as I was uh, maturing Mm -hmm. as a, you know, a growing person, there's just continually new things to discover. Yeah, it's so true. Uh, We grow up and we start to see the, the different nuances of what star Wars was trying to tell us, you know, the, and it became part of the zeitgeist, you know, the common, language it even became a religion you know jedi (laughs) became an actual religion but i was disappointed when i first saw empire strike back and i think it was because i was just a teenager and i was like i want them to win all the time you know and all this and i didn't realize 
here years later, it is the glue that ties all of the properties together. Yeah. Every Star Wars, it's this, you know, you know, is the Joseph Campbell, you know, the warrior, you know, the hero's journey, um, where Luke has to go into the cave. When you saw Empire Strike back were you disappointed or were you like whoa you know it's something so here. funny that you that you mentioned that because today universally 99 fans out of 100 will say that empire is their favorite but you're yeah. right a lot of people forget that people were were angry at the empire strikes back and and um and i think part of it is because you didn't have today you could watch empire and be like what and then you can watch jedi and then when you kind of watch all three, you can kind of go back and say Empire was was the one that had you the most on the edge of your seat. But when yeah. you didn't have Jedi to watch after that and you were just kind of left hanging, uh, yeah, people were real upset. Um, gosh, it's hard to say because I was so, as a kid, you're always into what's new and Yoda was new. Again, I was younger. I was seven when Empire came out. So I was really into like the ad at walkers and really yeah. into um, Yoda, but I was more into Yoda because he was cute. And the action figure came with a little snake <laughs> and it, it was the first figure that had like a cloth and it had the belt and it had a cane. So it had four accessories that was like unheard of for all the action figures. So, yeah. um, uh, and it wasn't until later, like you realize like everything that Yoda says, my gosh, how profound is that? Yeah. Um, so it's cool. Yeah. That in the beginning when he's acting like a buffoon and a fool and it's like, oh, he's in a hurry. You are, you know, and you're like sitting there, he's banging on stuff and people, you know, banging the, that's a puppet. That's Frank Oz underneath making that thing work. Um, the, it was just astounding to watch. And then when Luke finally realized this is Yoda, he feels like an idiot. Um, and those are, are such profound storytelling devices to get us to wake up yeah you know it's it's why the brothers Grimm wrote their fairy tales you know it's it's uh you know it's very very powerful storytelling so um so let me let me go to the next level what did you get trained in this you went to art school what what happened yeah. So, um, you know, I, I knew that I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to do, but the problem was I wanted to do it all. I wanted to make comic books. I wanted to make movies. Um, I wanted to write stories. I wanted to design video games. Mm -hmm. I was into it all. But back then you were always told you pick one thing to master and that's it. Otherwise you're spreading yourself too thin. And that kind of freaked me out. Cause I felt like, man, anything that I pick, I'm automatically closing the door to everything else. And boy, did I grow up at the right time because yeah. now it's almost the opposite. The more skills you have, the more viable you are for a bunch of industries. And when things are kind of slow in this area, you just kind of hop into, into something else. And obviously with the, uh, the technology at our fingertips, it's never been easier to kind of do what you want when you want, um, which is great. But um, I grew up, I didn't really grow up poor in the sense of what mo most people would think is poor, but I definitely um, wouldn't have been able to go to film school. Um, I didn't have a car uh, during the time that I was uh, in college. So for me, um, art school just seemed like the, the thing that would be the easiest to do. I couldn't afford a film camera, but I could afford pencils, maybe some paints. I could afford some markers and uh, and that just seemed like the thing. And I was pretty, I felt like I was pretty good at drawing. So that was just kind of the thing to go into. And after getting my associate degree uh, here in the Detroit area at Macomb College, mm -hmm. um, I applied for Art Center, which is where all my heroes went to school that uh, like Drew Struzan, who designed the Indiana Jones and Star Wars movie posters, but also mm -hmm. Ralph McQuarrie, who did all the original oh, yeah. designs for Star Wars. Um, just a bunch of my heroes, every single one of them went to Art Center. So I was like, this is where I have to go. And so I moved to uh, Los Angeles, went to Art Center, and that's kind of where I began my career in the uh, in the 90s. Didn't Ralph McQuarrie also do uh, the Blade Runner uh, series? He did the all the Gosh. paintings and the drawings. I think it was him, and they they were so astounding. They decided to shift gears with 
Blade Runner and do it exactly like he did. Yeah. You know, the concept drawings and paintings. That might have been Sid Mead, who also went to Art Center. Uh, Ralph McQuarrie also did Battlestar Galactica and a bunch of other films. But uh, but Sid Mead uh, didn't work on Star Wars, but designed Alien and Blade Runner and yeah. uh, uh, and is considered the godfather of uh, concept design. It's it's astounding how we've made this huge leap because I, I remember, you know, when I was 17, I guess it was um, uh, a teacher handed me the Children of Dune. Oh, yeah. You know, and I started reading it. He says, hey, if you get past the first 78 pages and, and you understand the dictionary, you'll you'll be able to finish the book. And I, I worked really hard to get past those first 78 pages. And I said, this is science fiction masterpiece work. And that became the norm in, in, in our world. All of a sudden now, you know, you saw these incredible concept paintings. You saw the, that the science fiction part of it, the science actually worked, you know, going to this crazy environment, Tatooine and, and, and seeing how the androids interacted with people and how, you know, the, 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 the overtones of, of, uh, what do you, what do you call it when they, the people hate droids? It's not racism. It's, you know, <laughs> robotism or whatever. Yeah. And, and then you have this council of Jedi's. There was so much mystery. It made you lean forward is what I wanted to say. Um, that's incredibly powerful. So you, you went out to Los Angeles with, with, with a suitcase and a, and a pocket full of dreams, right? Yeah, basically <laughs> that was it. Sure. Um, and then I started simultaneously working, uh, working in film. Um, I had opportunities. I started getting agents doing storyboards, uh, for films, but also for tons of commercials and basically anything that was going to pay me to draw, I right. said yes to. I was just really terrified of, you know, there were a lot of people. My, I, thankfully, my parents always were very encouraging of what I wanted to do. But there were so many people that were like, oh, starving artist. I don't know, man, really? You want to go and become an artist? Good luck with that. And uh, so I definitely... Um, uh, said yes to everything that came my way. I was just happy to to be getting paid to draw. Like that was amazing yeah. to me. And uh, eventually it got to a point where I was able to say yes to the jobs that really sounded fun or the jobs that that paid a lot. And then I got to say no to the, you know, anything that just sounded like work or, um, or you know, the jobs that didn't pay as much. Yeah. Uh, it just got to a place where I was just very uh, fortunate to be able to make those decisions. You know, I got the same lecture, you, you know, you're never going to survive. You're never going to make a living, blah, blah, blah. And my father was a doctor of chiropractic medicine and had a bachelor's degree in chemistry. So he's all up here, you know, sure. and uh, I'm playing drums on the weekends, getting paid yeah. and, and I'm painting and drawing in class. I, I would be doing two or three paintings at one time in our class because um, our art, uh, program at, at Lebanon high school was really advanced and a big shout out to Mr. Ken Walmer and Mr. David Opilo. Uh, they, they were, um, they were my art teachers and, uh, very inspirational. Uh, but one of the things that I, I realized, you know, I was growing up at a time of transition and probably didn't know it, you know, I, you know, you're in the middle of a revolution and you don't know it. One of my favorite phrases. Uh, and so, I was also getting that lecture from my dad, you know, you sure you want to do this for a living and blah, blah, blah. And that I had good grades, but my dad was not supportive until we, every year we had a big art show. And for two weeks, the students got to come up and take a tour of the art, the two art departments. And then parents were invited the following week. And all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're up there and my parents took a tour and they're all, I remember they were all bundled up because it was like March or April. And, uh, my teacher pulls them aside and I'm working on a painting and they my parents are kind of blown away. Cause I don't think I showed them all my artwork. You know, I showed them a few things, but I had won, you know, all these awards and Mr. Opilo, God bless him. He leaned over and he goes, you know, your son's very talented. He could make a living doing this, this, and this, you know, he made a list. And from that moment on, my dad was like a Stepford uh, dad. <laughs> he, he supported everything. Like he went, he drove out to Philadelphia to make sure I attended the orientation for the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, Temple University, all these places. And 
but I didn't, you know, it was still a pipe dream to want to work in Hollywood for us. You know, the baby boomers, it's get a job, get something stable. So I moved to New York City and became a graphic designer. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, that was what it is. But here's one thing I did do. Uh, I did a lot of voiceovers for uh, TV commercials and stuff. So I did um, eight voices on Legends of Zelda, The Adventures of Link. No and, way. Yeah. So whenever people are on my show, I kind of, I do everything from, you know, you know, to the, you have failed me for the last time, you know, those kind of, yeah. and, and Christopher Walken. Uh, but uh, so I, I, that's my little contribution to whatever is out there in the world. You've yeah. done the real stuff. So l let me ask you this next question. When did you start getting a chance to work on Star Wars stuff? How did that happen? Did you get introduced to George Lucas or what was yeah. it? Well, the very first thing that happened, it's kind of a funny story because, um, you know, I was trying to make my way into the art world and I was living in Pasadena, California, and uh, I went to uh, this brand new book superstore that was called Barnes and Noble. And, <laughs> and I walked there. It was like it was only two miles away. And so I had walked there and I was just blown away because it was the first store. Normally, when you went into a bookstore, if you started reading books or going through the magazines, they'd say, hey, if you're not going to buy it, get out of here. You know, they actually yeah. had couches like they encouraged people to sit down and, you know, get, you know, give it a test drive. And that was actually very smart because. That would get people hooked and then they'd end up you know buying the books anyway there was this book called the star wars adventure journal and it was put out by the company that does the role-playing game actually they were from trying to remember the city they're actually from pennsylvania they were called west end games oh, yeah. and uh i forget the name of the city but uh anyway in the back of the book they had this ad and it said that they were looking for published writers to write short stories for this book and this book was illustrated, by the way. There was lots of cool artwork and stuff. So uh, writing was one of the things that I wanted to do, um, although at the time I was pursuing art. So on a whim, I, I contacted them. And I didn't lie on my resume, but I had done some of my own self-published comic books where it was literally me Xeroxing pages and stapling them together and right. delivering them to comic book stores when I still lived in Detroit. So I kind of put that on my resume. I got the green light to submit a short story. <laughs> That's awesome. So then I, I contacted them and it doesn't mean they're going to use it. It just meant that they would, they would, you know, I could submit it. So then I contacted them and I said, Hey, could I do the artwork? And they said, Whoa, 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 relax. Listen, we already have a team of, a, you know, Lucasfilm approved artists who we're working with. So, uh, that's not going to happen. But if you wanted to do a couple sketches, you could send those in with your story and we could take those sketches and we could show the real artists kind of what you have in mind. Maybe they'll use them. Maybe they won't. The okay. real artists. <laughs> right, right. So I sent in the, I wrote the best story that I could. I uh, did the best artwork that I could. Heard from them right away. They weren't interested in the story at all, but they said, you know, we really like your artwork. If something comes through, if there's an opportunity, we'll let you know. So I thought that was nice. I'm like, I'm sure I'll never hear from them again. The very next day, I got a phone call and they said, listen, one of our artists flaked out. We need five black and white spot illustrations. We need them tomorrow. Can you hook us up? And I was like, absolutely. I stayed up all night and you know did these five tiny spot illustrations. And it was so funny because when the very first book came out that had my work in it, I remember I went to the store and I bought it and I would show all my friends and, you know, they'd start flipping through and there'd be like a full color, you know, Darth Vader illustration. Oh, did you draw that? No, keep going. Oh, did you draw the Millennium Falcon? No, no, keep going. <laughs> they'd finally get to a page where there's this small black and white. It's like a rebel commando and it's someone they've never seen before. I'd say, you see that? I drew that. And they'd be like, wow. Oh, did you draw Boba Fett? No, no, keep nope. going. There's another one, you know, but, uh, but it started there and then I was invited back for the next book. And that time they asked me to do seven illustrations and one of them was a half page, you know, oh. and eventually I got asked to do full pages and then full color and then invited to do uh, covers. And then the cool thing was a lot of these editors and a lot of these publishers that were working with the Star Wars brand, they're all friends and they all talk to each other. So inevitably 
they would contact each other and say, hey, you know, we need an artist for this. Do you know anyone? And they'd say, you know, this Matt Bush kid, he's always on time. He's really good at making changes when we need something a little bit different. You know, give this cat a call and things just kind of spider webbed from there. That's amazing. That's a very cool story. You know, it, it combines, you know, just being in the right place at the right time, being observant, being relaxed instead of on at the edge of your seat. And people seeing that your work is good, you know, you you do good work. Um, that's powerful, man. That, Thank thanks you. for sharing that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's funny, you know. You show your portfolio to people, and they're like, "Oh, you you didn't do that. <laughs> you did that." <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's let's continue onward. Uh, when did you start getting bigger bigger projects uh, with Lucasfilm? Gosh, well, things just kind of spider web from there. And it was really, um, there was never an overnight thing where like I ever felt like, oh my gosh, now I've made it. Cause then, you know, like early on, uh, I was only a few years into my career where already I was illustrating covers to books that were New York Times bestsellers, which was awesome. And then, you know, I got to illustrate um, posters and, um, uh, in you know, movie posters and uh, all kinds of things. And um, uh, the other thing too, is that a lot of people see the successes and you can go to my website and you see all of my wins and awards and everything else. But what people don't see is all of the fails. And there's so many things for every project that went through and people really responded to it well. And like the numbers were great. There's so many things that like, the project never, you know, it, it didn't even come out. Like people didn't even see yeah. all the work that I did or things that I thought were going to be huge. I put all my time into, and then it, it's released. And then it just, it just doesn't, for whatever reason, it just doesn't, uh, it just doesn't find its audience. And, uh, and so it's moving on to the next thing, but for as many wins, there's fails. And so the career probably, I'm sure true of everyone, but you kind of, you roll with the punches and you get to what's real, you know? Ain't that the truth? Uh, people don't realize, you know, you, you, I learned this, you know, you learn this in college, uh, going to art, art college. When you have a deadline, you have to make it. And you can't fake graphic design or illustration or painting or drawing. It, if you only put four hours into something, it's going to look like you put four hours into something. So you have to learn techniques that, shorten that time and sometimes a good illustration is 30 hours period that's it uh and people i don't think they realize that when it, when i first went to new york and started my career my friends sometimes would be a little insulting They're like well you get to draw for a living it's like um it's a little bit more in depth than that you know like for you a cover design you have to lay out where the title is going to be where um, the subtitle is going to be where the author's you know name is going to fall, and then you got to paint and draw and sketch everything in between that and make sure it fits properly. And then on top of that, you got to go through a bunch of roughs, uh, illustrations, quick you know pencil drawings to show uh, the art director who are whoever's making the decision three concepts. And if they don't like those three concepts, you got to do three more and three mm -hmm. and four and five, and then. You got to meet the deadline for the final painting. Um, so sometimes I, I, people think um, it is fun. I, I'm not going to lie. It is fun when your work is, you know, up there um, either on a screen or it's, uh, you know, in, in a printed magazine, it, it's almost forever. What's that feel like? I mean, you know, I know what it feels like, but I want our audience to really understand, you know, yeah. when you finally get something painted and drawn and you see it in a bookstore you see it on a 60 foot screen what's that like it's it's awesome it's um you know there's so many little things that that you don't realize where i've had people in other countries um if i've been to a show in another country i've had people come up to me and they'll show me they're real excited and they'll show me a tattoo of boba fett on their arm and i'll be like oh yeah that's cool and they're like no look and I'm like, yeah, Boba Fett, I've got Darth Vader over here. Yeah, that's cool. They're like, no, look. And I look and then I realize it's not just Boba Fett. It's the Boba Fett I illustrated that's on one of the book covers. And it's just like, oh, my gosh, like, wow. Like, it's <laughs> like, it's amazing. You know, you, you uh, 
it's uh it's unreal um so for the rest of your life you can go to comic-con and have a booth yeah it's uh <laughs> it's neat you know it's funny it's it you know it to me it's the perfect kind of fame and by no means do i consider myself a celebrity or anything like that but mm-hmm. that's exactly what i mean it's the perfect kind of fame where i can go to a comic-con i can go to a sci-fi show or a star wars show and i get to feel really special there's people that want me to sign books and posters and for a couple days i feel like a rock star but the good part is if um unlike other celebrities if i'm uh i don't get sick often but if i'm not feeling well and i need to go to the drugstore and get some medicine i don't like no one knows who i am i don't have people that are like oh my gosh hey you know can i sign your autograph here take a photo with me you know do the voice do the voice come on you know do the voice and just like I can imagine if you were Jim Carrey or something like that, like, oh my gosh, everywhere you go, like it would just be, uh, I mean, every, you, you would want it, but you wouldn't want it at the same time. Yeah. You know? I can only imagine, yeah. uh, you know, I'm just trying to buy NyQuil. <laughs> can you take <laughs> it back and out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm ready to throw up too. <laughs> like, yeah. You've got like, who knows, you know, Patrick diarrhea Stewart. or what you know yeah. every, we're all people so you never know like when fans show up at, at the wrong time you know uh patrick stewart said something he said when he was doing um a christmas carol on broadway he did the one-man show mm. in new york city so when he would go to rehearsal he'd walk through times square and th- he said the thing i love about new york you know he, he went off and he goes is nobody gets like you know, oh my God, it's Patrick Stewart. He said the construction workers would yell out to him, engage, you know, or something, you know, from, so, and that was it. He could walk yeah. to work in peace, get a cup of coffee. People would, you know, acknowledge him, but they weren't like in LA where people would run up and they want to get his autograph. And he says, it's so refreshing. And there's so much freedom nice. uh, in the New York, uh, you know, way, uh, you mm-hmm. know, we're not, we're not easily impressed. I lived there for so long. I know a lot of celebrities uh it, it yeah it's like we're we're like hey how's it going <laughs> you know you put your pants on one leg at a time yeah. uh, so did you ever get a chance to meet uh george lucas or work uh, go in you know and what? work with the team that is a great story i've been in the same room as george lucas probably seven times but every single time I've been under a contract that I have to sign uh, almost every time or I'm in a contract of that duration. And one of the things that it says is you will not approach Mr. Lucas nor talk to Mr. Lucas unless he talks to you first. So there have even been times where I am standing right next to him. He's looking at all of my artwork and I'm just waiting for him to say something. And I know he likes my work. He actually owns personally. Uh, almost 400 of my drawings and paintings. I have checks signed by him, uh, but he'll come in, he'll kind of look and he'll just go, huh. mm-hmm. no, no, no. and I'm just waiting for him to go, Matt, I really like your work. I really like this here. So I can say, oh my, thank you so much, George. And like, I can never, never mm-hmm. says a word. And, uh, uh, and so I actually haven't, I've been standing right next to him and just like not allowed to say anything. And, uh, and he is, he is the quiet one. So, uh, yeah. uh, I, I have to be honest. I actually haven't had that, you know, buddy, buddy, my arm around him. <laughs> Let's go grab a drink. That hasn't happened yet. I've smelled his cologne. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, you, you're a stalker who can never be satisfied. <laughs> you know, it's sort of like you're right there, yeah, right next to him. Wow. Yeah, I've but, heard that. But I've I get it though, and that's not even something. I I don't think that's something that he wants. But I think uh, his managers and everyone that works for him, if everyone wasn't under that contract, he would walk to. Well, he doesn't really go to work now, but at the time he was still yeah. running Lucasfilm there are so many people working there that grew up with star yeah. Wars that, that are fans. If they didn't have that contract in place, everyone would be bum rushing. them, going, Hey George, you know, that time in the empire strikes back when C3PO says in like question, you know what I mean? And he would like, he would never get any, well, th- th- those rules are there for, for good reason. It, it reminds me of that uh, skit that Chris Farley used to do where he would, 
pretend to be a talk show host on a local, yeah. you know, cable network. And he goes, you, you, you remember that time when, when, when C3PO, uh, you know, did this and you, that was awesome. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, but I hear industrial light and magic and, uh, you know, all those um, places where they film and the studios and everything. I, I hear it's just the energy is contagious uh, because it's, it's probably if we could imagine the place where you could bring your creative nature to its highest focal point, this is it. Would you say that's true? It is. And there's something about it. Um, you know, having lived in LA because you get, it's also very contagious and creative there with all of the studios and you walk through any of the animation studios or any of the film studios and everyone's got their cubicle and they've got their action figures and their artwork up and it is, it's creative everywhere, but there's something about Skywalker ranch and Lucasfilm headquarters and industrial light and magic. Uh, when you're walking through there, uh, especially all of the areas at Skywalker ranch, it's so secluded and it's in the mountains and to get there, you have to like, you have to drive through these valleys and it's so remote. And then when mm -hmm. you're there, it's not even in buildings. It's like these beautiful Victorian mansions and you go inside and it's just like beautiful woodwork. And it's, there's something about it. You really feel like you're in a museum and you can, um, you feel like you're a part of history and there's just something about it that is, that really is magical. It really is awesome. Yeah. And I can, I can only imagine, I mean, I, I would pay to just be able to walk through and, uh, you know, I won't look at George Lucas. I promise. <laughs> <Whoever> <laughs> says, I will look avert my eye content. contact. Yeah. Okay. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. <laughs> okay. Now you can look at me. Um, there was a director uh, on the Mandalorian and uh, I've, uh, pardon me, folks, I forget his name right now, but he talked about all the work he had done in animation and all these drawings he did. And then George Lucas calls him in and sits him down and they they go through all his drawings and some of the stuff and blah 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 and he's sitting there and he said it felt like he was like so excited and then george lucas kind of dismissed him and he went into another room and he's like did, did i get the job what happened you know he he had no clue where he stood and i think uh like an hour later somebody walked up to him to escort him out and he goes oh you know, George really loves your work. Uh, you know, congratulations. You, you got the job, you know, and he's like, what? <laughs> and he's like yeah. blown away by this. So, you know, you, you aren't the, the first person to talk about how George Lucas um, can be. And, and, yeah. is. and that's his, that's his, he's a creative genius. And I, every time I've met a really, um, a real creative genius, a lot of times they do have that quirky thing about them. One, it's that one thing, you know, yeah. Yeah. Dave Filoni is, I, I believe who you're talking about. And uh, yeah, they had a, a really good, re and he, he learned right away that less is more with George. And, uh, um, but it's neat because George, George is kind of like Yoda where he doesn't say a lot, mm -hmm. but when he does, it's like all ears are on. And, and what he says is usually pretty, pretty profound and pretty awesome. Yeah. Well, he changed the whole industry between him and Steven Spielberg. They changed an industry. Um, I, when I watched the original Star Wars films, the cuts and the pans and the way they did the dolly work and how they, they filmed in the desert from, you know, far away and then close ups. I mean, I noticed all those details and uh, they, they just changed the way filmmaking was done. You know, Indiana Jones. Uh, the first time I saw it, I was in college and I, I went to the movie and I, I was, I'm just aghast at, you know, one thing happening after another, the first 10 minutes, you know, it, it's one action shot after another. You're like, uh, uh, you know, it's yeah. like that used to be a whole movie. You know, now yeah. it's the first you 10 could, minutes. It's the, I, and I feel the same way. And that was what was so great about Raiders is the movie could have ended 10 minutes in and everyone would have felt like worth the price of admission. Like yeah. that movie was amazing, but that's just the first 10 minutes. I know. So you've worked on a number of films and I want to lead up to your feature, Aladdin 3477. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. When, yeah. When did you get to work on some, some films actual 
actual yeah, film so, projects. So um, I got to work on films like this is in the '90s where I was working on films like Con Air, and um, uh, there was a number of films that I got to work on. Probably the greatest story and greatest learning experience that I had, though, was working on the film The Matrix. Mm. What was interesting about it was. When my agent called me, uh, I was doing a lot of Star Wars work at the time. And my agent said, listen, we've got a new film. Uh, this is going to be the new Star Wars. We want you to start. We want you to work on it. Start next week. We're going to send you the script. Read it over the weekend. You start on Monday. So I was real excited. Got the script. And it's kind of hard to imagine because when you think of The Matrix, you've seen the film. So you already know right. kind of what it's like. But if you can imagine taking away what it looks like and what you know of it and just reading the script i was incredibly disappointed i didn't get it at all it also didn't help the fact that my agent had kind of prefaced it with this is the new star wars that's going to be star wars for a new generation right i was five pages in going okay where are the cute lovable robots where's the <laughs> villain that has the weird breathing where are the starships yeah. Like I, so I was already disappointed, kind of had a chip on my shoulder reading the rest of it made no sense uh, at all. And I just didn't have the imagination for it, I guess. So I worked on, and at the time it was actually going to star Tom Cruise. <laughs> so, and I was, and Tom Cruise, love him or hate him. He always brings his a game. So at yeah. least there, there was that, you know, but still I was like, what is this? Well, after working on it for probably a week and a half, um, Tom Cruise bowed out to instead work on a film called Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Kubrick. Right. So the, the whole project closed down. And I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, thank goodness. Right. So uh, a few months went by and I think I had heard that Will Smith was attached for a while and then he wasn't. I got a, uh, a call from my agent one day and they said, Hey, the matrix is back on. And I was like, Oh man, like I just, what, you know, I just wasn't excited about it. And they said, but this time there's no Tom Cruise. There's no Will Smith. It's starring Keanu Reeves. And I was Whoa. like, Oh my gosh. Cause at the time he was still kind of, you know, Bill and Ted and couldn't Whoa. escape that. Whoa. There was another yeah. movie that had just come out. That was also sci-fi called Johnny mnemonic that he started. Yep. That, I saw that, that wasn't, uh, that, that wasn't, uh, anything to write home about. So, uh, I was not interested at all. So I said, can I, can you give me a day to think about it? Cause it meant for the next nine months, I would be working on this film called the matrix. So true story that same afternoon, I got a call from another one of my agents and they said, Hey, we've got this film uh, called The Devil's Own. And I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Tell me more about it. And they said, well, it stars Harrison Ford and Brad Pitt. So I was like, oh my gosh, I've never worked on a film with Harrison Ford and Brad Pitt also. Very exciting. I said, yeah. tell me no more. I am in. So I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Devil's Own, but it's horrible. It is just <laughs> so bad. And I don't know if you've ever seen a movie called The Matrix, but it's amazing. Yeah. And, uh, and I passed on on working on, on the rest of The Matrix for that. But the reason why I like this story is because um, when I saw The Matrix, I was blown away. And it was so familiar because I did read the script. Right. But the thing that, that it taught me is that, and I remember when I was working on The Matrix for the week and a half that I did, everyone else was so excited about it. And I remember being in the art department like, what are, what is everyone so excited? You guys have read right. the script, right? This is like, this is redonkulous. Like this does, this isn't good at all. But what it taught me is whatever you are working on, whether you're working on a, a television commercial for toilet paper, or you're working on Star Wars, whatever it is, if you're not excited about it at, at first, try to find the beauty in it. Try to, yeah. if it's not exciting, that's your job. Make it exciting. What can you do to bring to the table to take what you think is boring? That's what you're being hired for. How can you make it awesome? And so that was a really good learning experience for me. Anything that you've that you've signed your name to that that you're um, that you're putting your name on, bring your A game. And if it isn't cool, make it cool. Find a way to make it great. You said a mouthful, my friend. Oh, the I'm wisdom sorry. of the wisdom of Yoda <laughs> rubbed off on you. Uh, you know, I learned that too the hard way uh, because uh, you know when you're when you're freelance like I was and you are, um, mm -hmm. your reputation begins to build, 
other studios start to hear about you. And if you're kind of a jerk on one uh, of the projects, that gets around more than how talented you are sometimes. So um, I, yeah, I've learned that it doesn't matter if it, I did a lot of corporate uh, shows with AV, you know, up on a big screen. I made the CEO look like a rock star, basically. And so you walk in the room and they they hand you a script and you're like, they really believe this, you know, some pharmaceutical CEO, and you still have to bring the A game all the time. And then the, there are problems sometimes on site, you know, when, you know, uh, we had on site one day <laughs> where the, the framework for the projection unit, the size, I was given the wrong size. And imagine creating thousands of pieces and layers of artwork that's the wrong size. So the projection guy just blew it up a little. <laughs> And the producer was furious with me. And then I showed him the email where he gave me the size, the wrong size. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was calm through the whole thing. So I don't know about you, but my reputation is calm and professional. Yep. When that, when that, you know what, the dookie hits the fan, they always know, Hey, he never, he never loses it. You know that. So that took years, man. <laughs> so uh, what, what has been your favorite project to work on? Cause it, uh, I don't know if anybody understands this, but you're you're storyboarding an entire movie, which means you do, you're doing the little frames, frame by frame. You're trying to draw so that it looks like the actors that they've told you are going to be in the film. And you have to understand camera angles, cinema, cinematography, uh, the flow of storytelling within a movie, the highs, the lows, and all that. So what were some of your other favorite projects? Gosh, Um there's so many. One of the things that I really enjoyed, I got the opportunity. It was something that I pitched to Lucasfilm. And there's so many things that I pitched that they said no or weren't interested. And then there were things that I pitched that they said they weren't interested in. And I put so much work into it. And then like three years later, they came back and they said, hey, we've got this idea. We thought you might be interested. And it's the exact same thing that I pitched to them three years before. I'm glad they came to me, but it's like, yeah, of course, I'd love to do that. But do, one of the do things you remind them that it was me. <laughs> oh yeah. And I'm like, in fact, I have the first three chapters right here. And that wow. was the case with, uh, with the, you can draw star Wars book. But uh, one of the things that I, that was just an incredible honor was I had this idea to do an Indiana Jones world map, which would show, it would be a giant world map where it would show all of the locations where Indiana Jones had discovered uh, uh, archeological artifacts uh, uh all over the world and at first it started where it was just going to be the films and once they said yes which i didn't think they were going to say yes but once and i did i did a sample you know i did like a really nice uh drawing of it and everything which already that took a long time to do but once they said yes i was like okay can we also do one where it's all of the films all of the indiana jones young chronicles or the young indiana jones chronicles tv shows the Disneyland theme parks, the comic books, the novels, and the video games. Wow. And they said yes. Man. So that was like three years of research, uh, put, compiling everything together back and forth with Lucasfilm. And so I illustrated the Indiana Jones world map. That is mind-blowing because I, I remember getting a couple of the Indiana Jones comic books and thinking, wow, you know, they've really created this... Uh, mythos and storytelling around so many platforms mm -hmm. um not just the movies and so that's a hell of a lot of work man whoa mm -hmm. yeah. thank you yeah three years yeah as a, as a graphic designer i know because i've had to put yeah. books together it's like well what? and just just in general just uh, aside from all of the indiana jones research illustrating the world was like even that in and of itself like i've i've literally drawn every country in the world <laughs> You know, that's incredible. It's, uh, it's wild. Yeah. So let's get to Aladdin 3477. Yeah. Uh, how did that get started? Uh, tell us, you know, and we're going to show a clip in a minute, but I want you to explain how you got to this, this, this story. What's it about? How'd you get here? Yeah. So when I was in college, you know, my dream wasn't just to work for George Lucas. My dream was actually to become George Lucas. And not I'd never wanted to be the giant business mogul with seven right. different companies, you know, but I wanted to create my own uh, sci-fi epic saga. I was just so inspired by that. Always really inspired by George Lucas. 
Um, I love, not only do I love Star Wars, but when you watch behind the scenes, what George had to go through to create Star yeah. Wars, there's so many interesting things where what you see on screen is so amazing. But when you see how many times uh, in the making where things went wrong or R2-D2 broke down, there's so many things you're looking at on screen where they could never get the remote controls to work for R2. So if you ever see R2-D2 moving across the screen where you don't see his feet, it's because they have a rope tied to his middle foot and it's literally someone pulling the rope and that's how R2-D2 is moving across the screen. And people don't realize the just the incredible sleight of hand that make that magic come to life. So I was just so inspired by that. So when I was in college in the early 90s, I began to write my own epic sci-fi saga. And um, the interesting thing that happened was uh, I noticed, and I started drawing it as a comic book. Uh, I was almost finished with the first issue when I was uh, simultaneously, I got hired by a magazine called Fan Magazine to do a full page illustration of Aladdin based on the Aladdin, you know, the Disney movie. Uh, and at that point, the di that movie had already been out for a couple of years. So anyway, as I was doing this illustration, it dawned on me, oh my gosh, my epic sci-fi saga that I had been developing for years, the nuts and bolts of it were very, very similar to Aladdin. There was no genie and there was no lamp, but it was this intergalactic con artist and there was no monkey, but it had this robot named Fiji that kind of floated by its shoulder. And, uh, uh, you know, there was a princess and there was not a sultan, but kind of like a father that was oppressive and all this stuff. Oh, my gosh. It was so similar to Aladdin. And even though I don't know, it, there's, uh, you know, there's so many stories that are similar. If you, I'm yeah. sure you know Joseph Campbell and the whole thing. Right. But to me, I just I started to realize I could I could tell that it was it was uh, indirectly. It was very, very Aladdin like. And I was just kind of bummed out by that. So I, I kept trying to change it. Like I kept trying to change genders or I tried to, but it never had the same flavor to it. Uh, as the years went on, I started realizing that, you know, Aladdin is public domain. So if I wanted to just make this Aladdin, I could do that. And I was never excited about that idea because I just didn't want, you know, there were all these other movies coming out that were like, you know, Hansel and Gretel, Witch Hunters, or Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> Vampire Hunter. Yeah. I didn't want it to be cheesy like that, like Aladdin yeah. in space. You know, I didn't, yeah. I didn't want it to be that. And also, I was like, how am I going to add a, like a genie and wishes and a lamp? Like, that's just, it just wasn't what I wanted. Um, so I kind of, uh, eventually, I kind of started realizing, what if I do, what if it's more of like an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure where it's a gin of wisdom and if it's it's not wacky, but what if it's kind of profound? And I just started coming up with these ideas and it got to a point where actually making it as Aladdin was more interesting than not making it as Aladdin. It was never an overnight decision, but that was kind of how I came up with the idea. And uh, so Aladdin 3477, this trilogy of films, it is the story of Aladdin, but it's set 1,500 years in the future. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to show a clip. This is the trailer for Aladdin 3477. Roll the tape. Explain everything. Yeah, you and your stupid Radiohead robot. Hey, I like to recycle. Oh, sure. Regal monarchs and maharajas handpicked by my father? My life is brimming with romance. Her 
we're better than this, Fiji. We belong up there. Like I said at the beginning, man, that right there, those graphics, the illust- the special effects, the CGI, damn, it, it's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it has that mix of Indiana Jones, a Star Wars. It has that Valorian okay. kind of feel. That and the fifth element, that sure. made my jaw just drop and go, whoa, because I am a, a nut job for science fiction, good science fiction. Yeah. And we're going to talk about this. So I'm, I'm super jazzed. Awesome. Uh, to talk about and it's your first you did it all yourself feature yeah. length film am i correct and it's it's a trilogy it's three of them i was that crazy to just do three right out the <laughs> gate <laughs> well i think that's become the new norm ever since peter jackson did lord of the rings do yeah. it all i want and then take your time editing did you partner with the studio what happened how'd you do this or is this all on your own this is all on my own and uh you know, one of the neat things as, as time went on throughout my career, uh, as you know, the digital revolution happened. Um, I remember in the late nineties, um, I remember George Lucas saying that the blockbusters of the future are going to be made by two kids, a Macintosh computer in their garage. That was going to be the Hollywood studio of the future. And I remember thinking that's going to be me. That's going to be me. And part of it, living in L.A., I did have a couple opportunities working with these studios where I got to pitch ideas and I had ideas for television shows and I did all the concept art. But I was, you know, the um, uh, just the hierarchy of everything, even though I got to make my pitches, I was just a concept artist. You know, I wasn't really a big producer and I could just tell going in my ideas were never going to be heard maybe over time i would like work my way through and eventually be someone important enough to where my ideas would be listened to but i just kind of knew my pathway i wanted to move back to the midwest where i could um i could kind of uh rebrand myself plus this was also during a time where when i started my career i was going to movie sets working with the directors doing the storyboards it got to a point where, you know, once everyone had email, I would just get emailed the script and I would say, hey, if you want me to come in, they'd say, nah, just email in your storyboards. I was never leaving my apartment. So I just, I was like, man, if I can do everything I'm doing now, but live in Detroit where, um, you know, the cost of living is a lot cheaper. And, uh, and if I can just go there and rebuild my own empire, one of the great things about Detroit, and I think you see this a lot in uh, places like Pittsburgh as well, but in Detroit, everyone's wearing these shirts that say Detroit hustles harder. And for a while, Detroit had really fallen on hard times. Detroit is really doing well right now, and it's definitely on the rise, but there's a work ethic that we have here. And I think you see it a lot in Pennsylvania as well. Uh, we're so down to earth and we're so we're thirsty for it. We're hungry for it. So I was able to build a team and I was able to finance making these films myself. And the project in its entirety really is an amalgam of everything I've learned throughout my career. So making the films, marketing the films, advertising the films, creating the movie poster, designing the characters, drawing the storyboards, all of it. I I mean, I didn't do everything. I had friends and family and also some professionals that uh that believed in the project that helped me out but 
for the most part, uh, I did it all myself. It's my magnum opus. It, it's, it's my dream. Uh, it's, it's just been awesome to, uh, to do this. And finally, after 13 years of serious work, finally, now people are seeing it and, uh, the response has been awesome. That's incredible. It's been a great Thank story you. and an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I have a lightning round where I ask you three questions that, uh, so our guests get to know you better, but how yeah. do we get a hold of you? What website should we go to we yeah. check out your work? Let us know. What is it? Uh, it's my website is just mattbush.com and it's M A T T spelled like the beer, not like the shrub. So B U S C H. And mm -hmm. then, um, uh, you can find me everywhere on socials. Uh, if you look for Matt Bush, B U S C H, you'll find me everywhere. Yeah. Fantastic work, my friend. And, uh, you know, I'm somebody who recognized the, the talent, you know, when Tom reached out to me and I looked, I went, whoa, uh, just knocked my socks off. I look forward to it. Uh, is it coming out in theaters or are you just going to have an online, uh, launch? You know what? We are still, uh, we, we don't have a distributor locked. My goal is theaters and for sure it'll, there'll be at the very least, there'll be a couple premieres and showings in Detroit and in Los Angeles for sure. It'll be streaming at least on Amazon and on iTunes. Uh, but maybe something more than that as well. We'll see what happens when we, uh, when we solidify a distributor. Maybe you could ask George or someone uh, near I, George. <laughs> help I mean, stranger things have happened, but uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> that would be awesome. Awesome. My friend. Uh, so welcome to the lightning round, Matt. All right. <laughs> I'm going to ask you uh, three questions. So our listeners get to know you better. All right. Uh, what would be the dream person you would want to work with? Oh, gosh. Uh, off the top of my head, uh, Taika Waititi. Uh, yeah. right now. I think he's just a, a creative uh, powerhouse. So interesting. And um, he also, but on a much bigger scale than me, he's someone that he gets an idea and he does it. And he's in a place where uh, he's got an army of people that, that jump to it and he's able to make things happen. But, uh, uh, to be able to sit down with him and pick his brain would be, uh, would be incredible. Awesome. Uh, second question, who is your favorite science fiction author? Do you have one? Oh my gosh. You know, uh, that is a, uh, gosh, <laughs> I, I would probably just have to go with George Lucas. And uh, even though he's yeah. not, uh, 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 considered an author per se, but I would say just as a storyteller and some of the ideas that he introduced, um, and just kind of changed the world of, uh, obviously of films, but also, you know, the science fiction books that we read as, as well. Yeah. So I would have to say George. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but before George Lucas had star Wars come out, women in cinema and literature, that the, that could save themselves, the warrior princess. You didn't find a lot of that. Maybe you'd see Kate Hepburn in a movie or Lucille Ball, uh, you know, being the strong woman. But after uh, Star Wars, all the science fiction genres, uh, from Gina Torres to you know uh, Catherine Janeway <laughs> to you know um, strong women, uh, science fiction led the way. They really did. So, mm -hmm. my third question. What's your favorite memory? Gosh. Um, you know, my, some of my favorite memories are definitely as a kid. Um, uh, and it's probably an amalgam of them, but I would mm -hmm. say uh, playing by myself as a kid, whether with action figures, building Legos, uh, drawing my own comic books, but just being in my own world. And a lot of times at recess, I would get invited to play kickball and everything else. I was more, I would just go hang out in the trees and I would just come up with stories. And I just, um, I just loved uh, being in, in, in my own, in, in my own world. Almost wow. to a fault for sure. You know, but yeah. You and I were separated at birth, my friend. I, I used to do stuff like that too. Um, Matt, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Uh, you get back to Pennsylvania every once in a while. You say you're still a Pennsylvania boy. Yeah, at heart. yeah, I I love it. And um, just real quick, one of the things that I love about Pennsylvania, I've been to. I used to do a lot of shows there, and now that Aladdin's done, I look forward to coming back. 
But um, one of the things that always strikes me about Pennsylvania is when I moved to Los Angeles, you know, everyone's real uh, kind of materialistic out there. Yeah. My best friends that I met when I lived in LA, who I'm still friends with to this day, somehow I became friends with the guys in the band Poison. They are the most down to earth people yep. you'll ever meet. And they're from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And it's like, of course yeah. you are. And there's just this, this Midwest hard work ethic, but also yeah. just super, super genuine. Uh, just, just the nicest people that, that, that you could imagine. They would uh, give you their shirt off their back and, and have you come in and sit down and have a meal. I remember my grandmother, you know, we had a couple of kids in the neighborhood I would play with and I didn't understand this, but evidently um, they, they were dirt poor, you know, and we oh, were yeah. poor already. Uh, my grandmother would just bring them in and make them a liverwurst sandwich, <laughs> and potato chips, you know, and an wow. iced tea. Um, you know, that's the way I was raised, man. You know, that's yeah. a, don't be, a, don't be a pretentious jerk just cause you, you know, you've um, been at the, the top of the mountain. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You still got to take out the trash at the end of the day and put sure. your, your pants on one leg at a time. Matt, it has been an honor to have you on Awakened Nation, my friend. Uh, I really look forward to seeing this film, Aladdin 3477. Uh, the work that you've put in, um, the artistry, the magic, everything, your story. And and you're young still. I'm sure you're going to have a lot of milestones that you're going to conquer uh, after this. But thank yeah. you for being on Awakened Nation, my friend. I appreciate it. And hey, I want to be back when Movie 2 comes out. Hell yes. I want, yeah, you're coming back on. <laughs> Definitely. Because uh, we are science fiction fanatics here. So uh, uh, I'm trying to get Matthew Mercer on. Uh, okay. He does the, uh, the voices on uh, Vox Machina. Machina. Okay. Yeah. And uh, does a couple of other things. Uh, yeah. I'm excited by this. So awesome. You're coming back on, brother. Excellent. Thank you. Thank hey, everybody. you so much, Brent. You bet, Matt. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Tune in next week. We have another extraordinary guest here on Awakened Nation. Uh, season five is sizzling up. Haven't you seen it? Huh? Huh? Admit it. Uh, anyways, tune in next week, my friends. Take care. Bye, Matt. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.